we're back with Star Girl. Uh, we're going to read chapters 25, 26, and 27 today. Um, and I want you to be thinking about uh, the character's motivation. I want you to be thinking about why would the characters do some of the things that they're going to be doing in this section of the text. So, thinking about motivation. Chapter 25. Days passed. I continued to avoid Star Girl. I wanted her. I wanted them. It seemed I could not have both, so I did nothing. I ran and hid. But she did not give up on me. She hunted me down. She found me in the TV studio after school one day. I felt fingers slipping down the back of my neck, grabbing my collar, pulling me backward. The crew was staring. Mr. Borlock, I heard her say, we need to talk. Her voice told me she was not smiling. She released my collar. I followed her out of the room. In the courtyard, a couple cooing on the bench beneath the palmetto saw us and com saw us coming and bolted, so that's where we sat. So, she said, are we breaking up already? I don't want to, I said. So why are you hiding from me? I forced, forced to face her, forced to talk. I felt my gumption rising. Something's got to change, I said. That's all I know. You mean like change clothes or change attire? Should I change attire on my bike? Would that do it? You're not funny. You know what I mean. She saw I was upset. Her face got serious. People aren't talking to me, I said. I stared, I stared at her. I wanted it to sink in. People I've known ever since we moved here. They don't talk to me. They don't see me. She reached out and lightly rubbed the back of my hand with her fingertip. Her eyes were sad. I'm sorry people don't see you. It's no fun not being seen, is it? I pulled my hand away. Well, you tell me what it's like. Doesn't it bother you that nobody talks to you? It was the first time I had openly mentioned the shunning to her. She smiled. Dory talks to me. You talk to me. Archie talks to me. My family talks to me. Cinnamon talks to me. Senor Saguaro talks to me. I talk to me. She cocked her head and stared at me, waiting for a responding smile. I didn't give it. Are you going to stop talking to me? That's not the question, I said. What is the question? The question is... I tried to read her face, but I could not. What makes you tick? Now I'm a clock. I turned away. See, I can't talk to you. That's all just a big joke. She put my face between her hands and turned me to her. I hoped people were not watching from the windows. Okay, serious now. Go ahead. Ask me the tick question again. Or any other. Any question at all. I shook my head. You just don't care, do you? That stumped her. Care? Leo, how can you, how can you say I don't care? I've gone, you've gone places, you've gone with me to places. We've delivered cards and flowers. How can you say, that's not what I mean. I mean, you don't care what people think. I care what you think. I care, I know, you care what Cinnamon and Senora Saguaro think. I'm talking about the school, the town. I'm talking about everybody. She sniffed around the word everybody. Everybody? Right. You don't seem to care what everybody thinks. You don't seem to know what everybody thinks. You, she broke in. Do you? I thought for a moment. I nodded sharply. Yeah. Yeah, I think I do know. I'm in touch with everybody. I'm one of them. How could I not know? And it matters? Sure it matters. Look, I waved my arm at the school around us. Look what's happening. Nobody talks to us. You can't just not give a crap about what anybody thinks. You can't just cheer for the other team and expect your own school to love you for it. Words that I know, words that I, I had been thinking for weeks rolled off my tongue now. Kovac. Kovac, for God's sake. What was that all about? She was baffled. Who's Kovac? Kovac, the guy from Sun Valley, the basketball star, the guy who broke his ankle. What about him? What about you? What were you doing out there on the floor with him with his head in your lap? He was in pain. He was the enemy, Stargirl, Susan, whatever. The enemy. She stared dumbly back at me. She had blinked at Susan. There were a thousand Sun Valley people there. He had his own people to take care of him, his own coaches, his own teammates, his own cheerleaders' laps. And you had your own team to worry about. I was screeching. I got up and walked away. I came back, leaned into her. Why? I said, why didn't you just let him be taken care of by his own people? She looked at me for a long time, as if 
In my face, she could find herself explained. I don't know, she said dimly at last. I didn't think. I just did. I pulled back. I was tempted to say, well, I hope you're satisfied because they hate you for what you did, but I didn't have the heart. Now I was feeling sorry for her. I sat back down beside her. I took her hand. I smiled. I spoke as gently as I could. Star girl, you just can't do things the way you do. If you weren't stuck in a home in a homeschool all your life, you'd understand. You just you can't just wake up in the morning and say you don't care what the rest of the world thinks. Her eyes were wide, her voice peepy like a little girl's. You can't? Not unless you want to be a hermit. She flicked the hem of her skirt at my sneaker, dusting it. But how do you keep track of the rest of the world? Sometimes I can hardly keep track of myself. It's not something you even have to think about, I said. You just know, because you're connected. On the ground, her bag shifted lightly. Cinnamon was stirring. Stargirl's face went through a series of expressions, ending with a pout and then, and a sudden sobby outburst. I'm not connected! She reached out to me and we hugged on the bench in the courtyard and we walked home together. We continued this conversation for the next couple of days. I explained the ways of people to her. I said, you can't cheer for everybody. She said, why not? I said, a person belongs to a group. You can't belong to everyone. She said, why not? I said, you can't just barge into the funeral of, of a perfect stranger. She said, why not? I said, you just can't. She said, why? I said, because. I said, you have to respect other people's privacy. There's such a thing as not being welcome. I said, not everybody likes having somebody with a ukulele sing happy birthday to them. They don't, she said. This group thing, I said, it's very strong. It's probably an instinct. You find it everywhere, from little groups like families to big ones like a town or school, to really big ones like a whole country. How about really, really big ones, she said, like a planet. Whatever, I said. The point is, in a group, everybody acts pretty much the same and that's kind of how the, the group holds itself together. Everybody, she said. Well, mostly, I said. That's what jails and mental hospitals are for, to keep it that way. You think I should be in jail? She said. I think you should try to be more like the rest of us, I said. Why? She said. Because, I said. Tell me, she said. It's hard, I said. Say it, she said. Because nobody likes you, I said. That's why. Nobody likes you. Nobody, she said. Her eyes covered me like the sky. Nobody? I tried to play dumb, but that wasn't working. Hey, I said, don't look at me. We're talking about them. Them. If, that, if it was up to me, I wouldn't change a thing. You're fine with me the way you are. But we're not alone, are we? We live in a world of them, like it or not. That's where I tried to keep it on them. I didn't mention myself. I didn't say to do it for me. I didn't say if you don't change, you can forget about me. I never said that. Two days later, Stargirl vanished. Chapter 26. Usually I saw her in the courtyard before school, but that day I didn't. Usually I passed her between classes at least once or twice before lunch. Not that day. In fact, when I looked over to her table at lunch, there was Dory Dilson, as usual, but someone else was sitting with her. No star girl in, in sight. Coming out of the lunchroom, I heard laughter behind me, and then a voice. Star girls. What do you have to do to get somebody's attention around here? I turned, but it wasn't her. The girl standing, grinning in front of me, wore jeans and sandals, had burnt red nails and lipstick, painted eyes, finger rings, toe rings, hoop earrings I could put my hand through, hair... I gawked as students swarmed past. She made a clownish grin. She was beginning to look vaguely familiar. Tentatively, I whispered, Stargirl? She batted her chocolatey eyelashes. Stargirl? What kind of name is that? My name is Susan. And just like that, Stargirl was gone, replaced by Susan. Susan Julia Carraway. The girl she might have been all along. I couldn't take my eyes off her. She cradled her books in her arms. The sunflower canvas bag was gone. The rat was gone. The ukulele was gone. She turned around slowly from my open-mouthed, dumbstruck inspection. Nothing goofy, nothing different I could see. She looked magnificently, wonderfully, gloriously, 
ordinary. She looked just like a hundred other girls at Micah High. Stargirl had vanished into a sea of them, and I was thrilled. She slid a stick of chewing gum into her mouth and chewed away noisily. She winked at me. She reached out and tweaked my cheek in the way my grandmother would and said, What's up, cutie? I grabbed her, right there out of the lun right there outside of the lunchroom, in the swarming mob. I didn't care if others were watching. In fact, I hoped they were. I grabbed her and squeezed her. I had never been so happy and so proud in my life. We sailed through time. We held hands in the hallways, on the stairs, in the courtyard. In the lunchroom, I grabbed her and pulled her over to our table. I looked to invite Droid Dilson to, but she was gone. I sat there grinning while Kevin and Susan gabbed and gossiped over their sandwiches. They joked about her disastrous appearance on Hot Seat. Susan suggested that I should go on Hot Seat one of these days, and Kevin said, no, he's too shy. And I said, not anymore, and we all laughed. And it was true. I didn't walk. I strutted. I was Susan Carraway's boyfriend. I. Me. Really? That Susan Carraway? The one with the tiny barrettes and toe rings? Yep, that's the one, my girlfriend. Call me Mr. Susan. I started saying we instead of I, as in, we'll meet you there, or we like fajitas. Whenever I could, I said her name out loud, like blowing bubbles. The rest of the time, I said it to myself. Susan. Susan. We did our homework together. We hung out with Kevin. Instead of following strangers around, we went to the movies and plunged our hands together into the $6 tub of popcorn. Instead of shopping for African violets, we shopped for Cinnabons and licked ice icing from each other's fingers. We went into Pizza Pizza. We walked past the bulletin board inside the door. We shared a pizza, half pepperoni, half anchovy anchovies. Anchovies? Ugh, I said. What's wrong with anchovies? She said. How can you eat them? Nobody eats anchovies. I was sort of kidding, but her face was serious. Nobody? Nobody I know. She picked the anchovies from her slices and dumped them into her water glass. I tried to stop her. Hey! She pushed my hand away. She dropped the last anchovy into the glass. I don't want to be like nobody. On the way out, we ignored the bulletin board. She was mad for shopping. It was as if she had just discovered clothes. She bought shirts and pants and shorts and costume jewelry and makeup. I began to notice that the items of clothing had one thing in common. They all had the designer's name plastered prominently on them. She seemed not to buy for color or style, but for designer label size. She constantly quizzed me about what other kids would do, would buy, would say, would think. She invented a fictitious person whom she called Evelyn Everybody. Would Evelyn like this? Would Evelyn do that? Sometimes she misfired, as with laughing. For several days, she was on a laughing jag. She didn't just laugh, she boomed. Heads turned in the lunchroom. I was trying to work up the nerve to say something when she looked at Kevin and me and said, Would Evelyn laugh this much? Kevin stared at his sandwich. I sheepish, sheepishly shook my head. The laughing stopped, and from that moment, from that moment on, she did a perfect imitation of a sullen, pout-lipped teenager. In every way, she seemed to be a typical, ordinary, everyday, run-of-the-mill teenager. And it wasn't working. At first, neither I neither noticed nor much cared that the shunning continued. I was too busy being happy that she was, as I saw it, now one of us. My only regret was that we could not play the, we could not play the basketball season over again. In my mind's eye, I pictured her aiming her incredible zeal and energy exclusively at the electrons. We could have won games on her cheering alone. It was she who said it first. They still don't like me. We were standing outside the TV studio after school. As usual, people were passing by as if we weren't there. Her lip quivered. What am I doing wrong? Tears made her eyes even larger. I squeezed her hand. I told her to give it some time. I pointed out that the state basketball finals would take place in Phoenix that Saturday, and that would end the season and clear the way for her cheerleading crimes to be forgotten. Her mascara was muddy. I had seen her sad many times before, but always for someone else. This was different. This was for herself, and I was powerless to help. I could not find it in me to cheer up the cheerleader. That night, we did homework together at her house. I ducked into her room to check out her happy wagon. There were only two stones in it. When I came to school the next day, there was something different about the buzz in the courtyard. The arriving students were milling about, some roaming at random, some in clusters. But as I approached, there seemed to be a distinct clearing around the palmetto. I wondered 
I wandered in that direction, and through the crowd I could see that someone, Susan, was seated on the bench. She sat upright, smiling. She was holding a foot-long stick, sh stick shaped like a claw on one end. Around her neck, dangling on a string, was a sign that read, Talk to me, and I'll scratch your back. She was getting no takers. No one was within 20 feet of her. Quickly, I turned away. I walked back through the crowd. I pretended I was looking for someone. I pretended I hadn't seen and prayed for the bell to ring. When I saw her later that morning, the sign was gone. She said nothing about it. Neither did I. Next morning, she came running at me in the courtyard. Her eyes were bright for the first time in days. She grabbed me with both hands and shook me. It's going to be okay. It's going to end. I had a vision. She told me about it. She had gone to her enchanted place after dinner the day before, and that's where the vision had come to her. She had seen herself re returning in triumph from the Arizona State Oratorical Contest. She had won first prize, best in the state. When she returned, she got a hero's welcome. The whole school greeted her in the parking lot, just like in the assembly film. There were streamers and confetti and tooting kazoos and horns blaring, and the mayor and city council were on hand, and they had a parade right then and there. And she rode high on the back seat of a convertible and held her winner's silver plate up for all to see. And the happy faces of her classmates flashed in the sparkling trophy. She told me this, and she threw up her arms and shouted, I'm going to be popular! The state contest was a week away. Every day she practiced her speech. One day she called over little P Peter Sinkovitz and his playmates and presented the speech to us in, in, from her front steps. Excuse me. We applauded and whistled. She bowed grandly, and I, too, began to see her vision. I saw the streamers flying, and I heard the crowd cheering, and I believed. Chapter 27 And our best wishes go with you, Susan Carraway, the PA announcement echoed through the lo school lobby, and we were off to Phoenix. The driver was Mr. McShane, Micah High's faculty representative to the state contest. Susan and I sat in the back. Susan's parents were driving their own car and would meet us in Phoenix. As we pulled out of the parking lot, she wagged a finger in my face. Don't get a big head, mister. I was allowed to invite two friends along. You weren't the only one I asked. So who was the other? I said. Dory. Well then, I said, I think I'll go for the big head. Dory isn't another guy. She grinned. No, she's not one of those. Suddenly, she unbuckled her seatbelt. We each had a, ba a back window. Mr. McShane, she announced, I'm going to move over so I can sit close to Leo. He's so cute, I can't help myself. In the rearview mirror, the teacher's eyes crinkled. Whatever you like, Susan, it's your day. She slid over and fastened herself into the middle belt. She jabbed me. Hear that? It's my day. I get whatever I want. So, I said, what happened when you asked Dory Dilson? She said no. She's mad at me. I could tell. Ever since I became Susan... She thinks I betrayed myself. She just doesn't understand how important it is to be popular. I wasn't sure what to say to that. I was feeling a little uneasy. Fortunately, wondering what to say wasn't much of a problem for me during that, that two-hour ride, because Susan chattered away like the old star girl the whole time. But I know Dory, she said, and I'll tell you one thing. What's that? She'll be in the front of the mob cheering for me when we get back tomorrow. I later found out after we left the school, the principal had spoken again on the PA. He announced our expected time of return on Saturday and suggested that everyone be on hand to meet us, win or lose. Losing, as it turned out, never occurred to the contestant herself. Would you do a favor for me? She said. I told her, sure. That big silver plate that goes to the winner. I'm such a klutz with dishes at home. Would you hold it for me when the crowd rushes us? I'm afraid I'll drop it. I stared at her. What crowd? What rush? In the school parking lot, when we get back tomorrow. There's always a crowd waiting for the returning hero. Remember the, the film at school? My vision? She cocked her head and peered into my eyes. She wrapped my forehead with her knuckle. knuckle. Hello in there. Anybody home? Oh, I said. That crowd. She nodded. Exactly. Of course, we'll be safe as long as we're in the car. But once we get out, who knows what will happen? Crowds can be, get pretty wild, right, Mr. McShane? The teacher nodded. So I hear. She spoke to me as if instructing a first grader. Leo, this has never happened in Micah before, having a winner of the Arizona State Oratorical Contest, one of their very own. When they hear about it, they're going to go bananas. And when they get a gander at me and that trophy, she rolled her eyes and whistled. I just hope they don't get out of hand. 
The police will keep them in line, I said. Maybe they'll call out the National Guard. She stared wide-eyed. You think? She didn't realize I was kidding. Well, she said, I'm not really, I'm really not afraid for myself. I won't mind a little jostling. Do you think they'll jostle Mr. McShane? Do you think they'll jostle Mr. McShane? In the mirror, his eyes shifted us. Never can tell. And if they want to carry me around on their shoulders, that's okay too. But they better not, she poked me with her finger. Better not mess with my trophy. That's why you, another poke, are going to hold it tight. I wish I wished Mr. McShane would say something. Susan, I said, did you ever hear of counting your chickens? Before they hatch, you mean? Exactly. I hear you're not supposed to. Exactly. She thought she nodded thoughtfully. Never made much sense to me. I mean, if you know they're going to hatch, why not count them? Because you can't know, I said. There are no guarantees. I hate to break this to you, but you're not the only person in the contest. Somebody else could win. You could lose. It's possible. She thought about that for a moment, then shook her head. Nope, not possible. So, she threw up her arms and smiled hugely. Why wait to feel great? Celebrate now. That's my motto. She nuzzled into me. What's yours, big boy? Don't count your chickens, I said. She shuddered mockingly. Oh, you're such a poop, Leo. What's your motto, M Mr. McShane? Drive carefully, he said. You may have a winner in the car. That set her off howling. Mr. McShane, I said, you're not helping. Sorry, he lied. I just looked at her. You're going to be in a, st in a state contest, I said. Aren't you a little bit nervous? The smile vanished. Yes, I am. I'm a lot nervous. I just hope things don't get out of hand when we get back to the school. I've never been adored by mobs of people before. I'm not sure how I'm going to react. I hope I don't get a big, big head. Do you think I'm the big head type, Mr. McShane? I raised my hand. Can I answer that? I think your head is just fine, said the teacher. She jabbed me with her elbow. Hear that, Mr. Know-it-all? She gave me her smug face, which promptly disappeared in the as she thrust her arms up and yelled, They're going to love me! Mr. McShane wagged his head and chuckled. Silently, I gave up. She pointed out the window. Look, even the desert is celebrating. It seemed to be true. The normally dull cacti and scrub were splashed with April colors, as if a great painter had passed over the landscape with a brush, dabbing yellow here, red there. Susan strained against her seatbelt. Mr. McShane, can we stop here just for a minute, please? When the teacher hesitated, she added, You said it's my day. I get whatever I want. The car coasted to a stop along the gravelly roadside. In a moment, she was out the door and bounding across the desert. She skipped and whirled and cartwheeled among the prickly natives. She bowed to a yucca, waltzed with a saguaro. She plucked a red blossom from a barrel cactus and fixed it in her hair. She practiced her smile and her nod and her wave. One hand, two hands, to the adoring mob at her hero's welcome. She snapped a needle from a cactus and with the slapstick pantomime of a circus clown pretended to pick her teeth with it. Mr. McShane and I were leaning on the car laughing when suddenly she stopped, cocked her head and stared off in another direction. She stayed like that, stone still, for a good two minutes, then abruptly turned and came back to the car. Her face was thoughtful. Mr. McShane, she said as, she, as the teacher drove off, do you know any extinct birds? Passenger pigeon, he said. That's probably the best known. They say there used to be so many of them, they would darken the sky when they flew over. And the moa. Moa? Huge bird. Like a condor, I said. He chuckled. A condor wouldn't come up to its knee. Make an ostrich look small. Twelve, thirteen feet tall. Maybe the biggest bird ever. Can't fly. Or couldn't fly. Lived in New Zealand. Died out hundreds of years ago. Killed off by people. Half their size, said Susan. <coughs> Mr. McShane nodded. Mm. I wrote a report about moas in grade school. I thought they were the neatest thing. Susan's eyes were glistening. Did moas have a voice? The teacher thought about it. I don't know. I don't know if anybody knows. Susan looked out the window at the passing desert. I heard a mockingbird back there, and it made me think of something Archie said. Mr. Brubaker? said Mr. McShane. Yes, he said he believes mockingbirds may do more than imitate other birds. I mean, other living birds. He thinks they might, they may also imitate the sounds of birds that are no longer around. He thinks the sounds of extinct birds are passed down, passed down the years from mockingbird to mockingbird. Interesting thought, said Mr. McShane. 
He says when a mockingbird sings, for all we know, it's pitching fossils into the air. He says who knows what songs of ancient creatures we may be hearing out there. The words of Archie Brubaker settled over the silence in the car. As if reading my thoughts, Mr. McShane turned off the air conditioner and powered down the windows. Hair blew in a, hair blew in a faint, smoky scent of mesquite. After a while, I felt the touch of Susan's hand. Her fingers wove through mine. Mr. McShane, she cooed, we're holding hands in the back seat. Uh-oh, he said, hormonal teenagers. Don't you think he's cute, Mr. McShane? I never really thought about it, said the teacher. Well, look, she said. She grabbed my face in her hand and pulled it forward. The teacher's eyes considered me briefly in the rearview mirror. You're right. He's adorable. Susan released my blushing face. Told you. Don't you just love him? I wouldn't go that far. A minute later, Mr. McShane. Now I felt something in my ear. I'm putting my finger in his ear. This sort of silliness went on until we rounded a mesa and saw the brown mist of the horizon that announced our appearance, our approach to the city of Phoenix. Hmm. So let's talk about motivation. What motivated Leo to tell Stargirl or Susan now um, that nobody liked her? What motivated Susan to try to be normal? And what motivated Dory to not join them? So let's think about the motivation of these characters. What are some of the things that you noticed, some of the details, some of the events that happened that may have motivated these characters to do what they did? Well, we'll read more tomorrow. See you then. Bye.